So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nemanja, uh, and I'll be talking today about WebAssembly, and especially for enterprise de de developers. So we'll see what that means and how you can use WebAssembly in your next project. So first question is actually, what is WebAssembly, or uh, known as BASM? So let's see the definition. It says that the WebAssembly is a binary instruction format for a stack-based virtual machine. And when you see that definition, you guys are probably like, oh, what does that mean? You know, it's, it sounds very confusing. I, 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 don't, I don't know what it is. So let's see a very kind of simplified um, explanation for WebAssembly. So let's compare it actually to JS because it's uh, they, they run together in the browser. So we wanna see how they compare and why is one better than the other. So when you have some JS code, right? Uh, and when this loads in, in, in your browser, it's picked up by the browser engine. And the browser engine then actually needs to, first of all, parse your code, then it needs to compile it, and then it, it's executed on your CPU. So I said, this is very simplified. There are also a lot of intermediary steps, but broadly, this is what happens in your browser when you load uh, some JavaScript files. And how does WebAssembly fare to, compare to that? So when you load WebAssembly into your browser engine, it immediately executes. So why is that? Well, I kind of go back to the same definition here, but I've highlighted the binary instruction. WebAssembly is a binary format. And this means that it's actually already pre-compiled, parsed and everything, and it's just ready to run in your browser. So what do we get by this? What are, what are some benefits from WebAssembly? Well, first of all, as you saw, it, it's, it's very efficient because we already pre-compiled stuff. And this also means that it's very fast because the browser itself doesn't have to do all these steps of parsing, compiling, and all this, all the, all these things. It can just immediately run. When I say portable, I really mean that it's portable because WebAssembly is not a format which is only built by the browser. It can also run in Node, and it can also run in some other environment as well. And the best, one of the good things about WebAssembly that that it works seamlessly with web. So. Um, there is no additional cost that you need to pay in order to run WebAssembly. Once you compile it, you can just run in the browser. And some of the use cases of WebAssembly, and I'm pretty sure that a lot of you already heard about WebAssembly because it's already here for a few years. And usually when we talk about WebAssembly, we hear some kind of um, use cases for facial recognition, you know, video games. It's a, it's a very, uh, I think, um, um, quite a lot of usage in, in video games for WebAssembly, virtual reality on, or some sort of image or video optimization, et cetera. But, you know, I kind of have a problem with that because I think a lot of us, well, most of the developers um, don't get to work in our day-to-day -day basis with these um, technologies or with video games or maybe some kind of um, AR, VR processing and stuff like that. And a lot of us actually work in enterprise. So then you ask yourself a question, well, should I know WebAssembly and uh, should, I, should I learn this and can it be also useful um, uh, in my day-to-day -day job? And um, hopefully this talk will convince you that the, the answer to this question is yes. And uh, where can we actually use WebAssembly in enterprise? Well, um, some of the stuff that were mentioned here is uh, data processing is a very common use case, I would say. Um, file and file transfer, file processing and file transfer, it's also very common to use a web assembly. And today we will be covering uh, uh, the three first points. Some of the other stuff that I kind of uh, have in mind is for example, sorting, or when you have some critical performance optimization, you can actually leverage web assembly to improve overall performance or responsiveness of your application. Uh, so let's, maybe not to uh, talk too much about the theory, let's see some things in practice uh, and how this is going to look like. Um, so here I have some kind of a very simple um, web app and we will quickly show what, what this does. So as I mentioned, we, we're going to uh, talk today about data processing and file processing. And as many of you know, uh, Excel is a go-to tool in, in small but also big cor corporations. Excel and CSV files, I think it's very common and I think all of us kind of uh, once, uh, at least once in our careers um, encountered this. So here I have two Excel files. Let's just quickly glance at the data, how it looks like and uh, what are we going to do uh, with this data? So here I have some kind of, um, it's dummy data. 
but this is actually a sales record. And I, I think there are 100,000 uh, records in this uh, CSV file. So you can see here, we have some kind of a country items, uh, date of disorder, unit cost and all these things. So what are we going to do in this app is we are, we'll be focusing on three columns. That's country, item type and unit sold. So one of the common tasks in any kind of data processing application is to summarize data. So as you can see, we have a lot of records here, but for example, let's say that the business wants to know how many clothes have been sold of per, per country or something like that. So today we are going to focus actually exactly on that. We're going to take one item type, for example, clothes, and then try to summarize how many units have been sold um, by country. Um, so let's see that. We mentioned clothes, right? We want to know what happens with clothes. And here in this web app, I, I, I have a, a few sections here, which we'll also cover, but there are also here a few buttons which uh, do some, some things. Um, since I'm comparing Rust and JS, we are going to take, uh, load this file, uh, process it and summarize data and, and show it in a bar chart. So let's let's start with JS and, and see how much time do we need to process this CSV for 100,000 records. So if I load it here and we get a bar chart and for example, uh, we can see that a lot of clothes are sold in uh, uh, UIA. Of course, this is dummy data, but I think this part is uh, uh, actually the most important one. It's a performance score table. And we can see that it took for this task in JavaScript, it took um, almost well, a bit less than a second. So overall, I would say that that's good for 100,000 records, um, but let's see Rust. Let's see how Rust compares to, to JavaScript for the, same, for the same task. So we are doing the same thing here. And again, you see that I, I have a, uh, the same data here. However, we can see that Rust kind of is a almost twice, twice, um, two times slower than JavaScript. So what happened? Um, you guys are probably wondering, like this guy just five minutes ago, he said that the WebAssembly is super fast and efficient, but uh, JavaScript uh, kicked ass uh, with this file processing. Well. Today, we are also going to learn some lessons um, about WebAssembly. Well, actually, there will be only two lessons, but they are very important. And uh, uh, I, I really want you guys to uh, try to remember them, because if you are working with, with WebAssembly, there are some things that you need to be aware of, the way how you design your applications. So first lesson is uh, WebAssembly only understands numbers. So what, are, what does that actually mean? Let's uh, go a little bit deeper here. I will quickly switch to the code so that you guys can see what happens in there as well. So let's compare it here. So on the left side, we have some Rust code and on the right side, we have some JS code. So essentially I, I kind of do the same thing in the beginning. I use this Papa, Papa is a CSV parsing library. So I, I just load the file use it in this, uh, um, use this Papa parse library to parse the CSV. And then here I, for example, pass in my data to the WebAssembly. So this is the part, the WebAssembly part. For the JS, I also do the same thing, right? I parse the file and then I'm using D3 library to do all this summarization and then show it in the, in the chart afterwards. So the important aspect here is this Papa parse. Uh, the thing that is passed to the, WebAssembly is actually an array of JavaScript objects. So just uh, keep that in mind. So let's see what, what happens there actually and why WebAssembly didn't perform well. Um, so as I said, WebAssembly only understands number, but I just said that when I load the file, I, I, parse, I parse it and then I send it to the, uh, an array of JavaScript objects. So what happens in the meantime? Uh, there is this library which is called Vasm Bindgen, and this library is, is kind of um, uh, generates a boilerplate code for you. So you still, as you saw in my code, I still work with JavaScript objects. I still work with something that's familiar. I never turn these things into numbers. That's what actually Vasm Bindgen does for me. It gener automatically generates this code, which does the translation part. So what happens here exactly is when I have this array of JS objects, the first thing that happens to these objects, they are stringified. So we turn them into a string first. 
And then this string is turned into a number. And then, as I said, remember lesson number one, WebAssembly can only understand numbers. Then we can pass it on down to the WebAssembly. And then uh, we turn these numbers into a Rust struct. Struct is, stands for structure. And um, maybe people from, who are coming from Java or, or C Sharp, uh, C -sharp uh, world, it's actually um, something like a class. So we turn this into something that's familiar to Rust. Then we do our processing and we turn the result back, back to the JS. So as you saw, a lot of things are going on there. But of course, I wouldn't be talking here today if I would think that WebAssembly is, is poor in performance. So let's see if we can improve, improve on this. So here I have a Rust uh, take two and I'm still doing the same thing. So we'll, we'll see later what, what changed. But I will again load this file and let's see. Oh, well, that was quite snappier. And as you can see here, it hit the number one in our charts. So 400 milliseconds for um, processing this. So what did I change actually? Let's go back to the code and let's see in the code what happened here. So one of the things now that is different from previous. If you remember, I did the CSV parsing in JavaScript before passing it to the WebAssembly. But now I say, okay, well, uh, Rust also has uh, CSV processing libraries. Why wouldn't I leverage this and do the CSV parsing and this processing inside of the WebAssembly? And this is actually what I, what I do. I just load the file here and then I, I send the text, the string to the WebAssembly. So let me go back to the presentation and show you how that works. So actually now you see that I've kind of already eliminated one step. Before I had to turn these JS objects into a string and then the string into a number, and then I can do my processing. But now I'm doing it, uh, I'm taking a different approach here. So I immediately load this text as a, uh, uh, this CSV file as a text, then Vassam Bindgen will turn it into a number for me. I pass it to WebAssembly. And now this, I added some, uh, new steps to the to my WebAssembly model. I use uh, uh, Rust already has um, libraries for CSV parsing, and I do this processing inside of the module. Again, I transform it into uh, something that it's uh, familiar to Rust. Execute and return, and you actually saw that th this has a, a huge implication on my on my speed of the speed of my um, application. But there is also, if you saw here in my web app. I actually have a third option as well. So can we even take this further? Can we even further improve this performance? Let's see what happens and let's see how it compares to the previous approaches. So again, same thing. I'm loading the CSV file and sending it to my WebAssembly module. And you can see that it, it, it just got faster. Now it's 200 milliseconds. So what do I do differently in this third approach? Well, as mentioned, maybe show it first in the presentation and see. So I said, very important lesson again, guys. Uh, WebAssembly only understands numbers. And instead of me, first of all, converting this JS objects or maybe loading the file as a string, I immediately load it as bytes, as numbers. And of course, this I can immediately send it to WebAssembly, turn these bytes into some values that I can work with, execute the code and return it. So. If you look back at the code, um, same thing happens, right? But if you look at our Rust code, and these are the three functions that I call here. So funny thing is, if you if you look at it, this first function here, this is the least performant one, but it has the least amount of code, only two lines, but it performs very bad as we saw. And then this middle one, a bit more code, but still performs better. And then actually here, the third one, it has most lines of code, but I think these 10, 10 slides of code are, are really, uh, really worth it. And if we see our uh, JS part of, of this application, here we can see when we load the file, file is actually in JavaScript loaded as something known as blob, and blob, blob exposes a method, which is known as an array buffer, which is actually just binary numbers. And then this is something that you, you can pass down to your WebAssembly module. So jumping back to the presentation, lesson number one, as we saw, and I kind of rephrased it here, whenever you can, 
talk with WebAssembly in the numbers because as we saw, it really impacts the performance of, of your, of your WebAssembly module. So lesson number two doesn't have to do exactly with how you load your data or process it. It's actually more on the way how you design your application. So I called it don't cross the JavaScript WASM border often. But what does that actually mean? What, what do I mean by that? Well, the thing is because of technical reasons, um, um, JavaScript uh, has its own memory and WebAssembly has its own memory. And um, JS memory can actually read and write into the WebAssembly memory, but uh, um, the other way around, it's not possible. So WebAssembly doesn't have access to JS memory. And when you want to do something, like for example, in my case, I wanted to process some um, some records, some some file, or, or or any type of data, I first needed to load this into the WebAssembly model. So this is what I mean, crossing the border. Every time when you want to process something, every time when you want to send data to WebAssembly module, this means crossing the border. And as we saw, if you are setting, for example, objects, you are going to pay a big price for this. Think of it as a, as a pay toll on a bridge. Every time when you want to cross the bridge, you need to pay uh, the toll. And it's the same here. And one of the approaches, well, of course, that doesn't mean that we, st we still have to you know, copy over the data to the WebAssembly memory. Of course, we, we need something to work with. Um, but a, but a good, uh, good rule of thumb here is that when you want to do this, copy the data once and then keep it in WebAssembly memory and do your computation there and just return the result, just return back the result. And I think that's a very um, kind of good pattern to have in mind when, when building web applications that, that run on, um, on WebAssembly models. So those are the two examples. Um, I fortunately uh, have to be cautious of, of time. So I won't have if you, if you look at my app there, uh, I have a third example for compression. Uh, the, code, the code will be shared afterwards so you guys can um, um, look, look in that into more detail. Uh, but just a brief what happens here is like uh, the, the second use case, as we mentioned is um, we, in enterprise, there's a lot of files. So if we want to process these files, usually we sometimes need to send them over to the server. And compression can be very useful. Of course, we all know for compression, but in most of the web application, it goes from the server to the client. So for example, gzip or broadly, we send some asset um, gzipped over the network, the browser decompress it, decompresses this, and then we can lo uh, load the application. But with WebAssembly, we actually now have a different, uh, we, can, uh, we can make this approach wor uh, work in two ways. We can actually compress some stuff on the on the web app itself, send it over to the network, and then decompress it on the server. This actually gives us the benefit of first of all saving some bandwidth for the user, uh, because we are decompressing this file, and also it can improve uh, significantly the responsiveness and the user experience. Because, for example, if you if you are running on a poor network or um, your upload uh, is is not that the greatest, and if you need to upload a 20 megabyte file this can actually uh, take a significant time. So WebAssembly can help you there and um, decrease this. So there is an example in the repo. Um, if you guys are interested, um, have a look afterwards and see if you can use this in your next project. Um, so what are the, the some actually benefits of, of, of using uh, WebAssembly in, in enterprise? Well, as, uh, as you guys saw it before, it's, it's very fast. If done properly, right, it can it can significantly improve uh, performance of your application. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I think a lot of people, um, the focus on WebAssembly is actually performance. When people talk about WebAssembly, it's performance, performance. But there is this other thing, which is I think it's very important and kind of not uh, ha doesn't have enough attention. It, actually, this can save you server costs. Why? Because the the whole thing, all this processing that we just did, they, they are done on the client inside the browser. So this means that you don't have to you know, upload the file, send it over to the server, and then, for example, pay uh, some money to AWS to store this um, uh, file to process it and then return the result. Basically, you eliminate this step completely, and you actually use the CPU from the user's uh, machine or, or a phone. 
and it can actually it can significantly uh, save you some costs. Third benefit is uh, it works offline. And for example, if you sometimes like in these uh, uh, scenarios where we need to process some file or, or do something, we can still do it offline. And then for example, when we have a network connection, then we can send the results to the server. It really depends on your use case and the type of application um, that you have. Another great thing is that uh, we can uh, use the libraries that are provided by Rust and C community. So uh, Rust is a, is a great language and C, I, I mean, of course we all know C, it's been around for decades now. And uh, some of the problems have been already solved in these communities, in these languages, um, maybe not in JavaScript, right? But you can still leverage these libraries and these uh, problem solving skills, and you can use them out of the box in your web application. And one benefit, uh, Today we have TypeScript, which kind of gets close to being a statically typed language, but I, I still think it's not the same uh, compared to some, something uh, like Rust. So for example, if you sometimes missed have, having a statically typed language in your day-to-day -day work, um, you can use, for example, Rust um, to, to build um, some WebAssembly modules and use them in your web applications. And from my experience uh, with working with WebAssembly for some time now is um, the state it's, I, I think it's good. Uh, as, you, as you guys saw, we, we can already use these things in our application. It, it's there, it's already been around for a few years. Um, and there are a lot of tools in it. Uh, but um, one of the things that I kind of, um, my, my experience is that the tools are still not there. Um, for example, you saw this Vassam Bindgen uh, library, which does ton, ton, tons of work uh, for you. Uh, but however, if you have some kind of specific use cases or, or something is not working, it, it can happen that you've, you need to go a bit deeper or maybe uh, um, check the GitHub issues or maybe check the source code of the library to try to find something that uh, works. And also I think, uh, developers coming from the JavaScript of web development workflows. I think we're a little bit, a little bit spoiled with this React and all these things, for example, because you have the create React app CLI, all these CLIs, and you just run one, two commands and everything is magically generated for you. Um, WebAssembly Rust um, has, has similar tools, but I, I, I still think it's not one, one two commands. Um, sometimes you need to do a bit more and you need to do a bit more pump, plumbing um, to uh, get it working, but the tools are there and I think they are ready for production because um, uh, there are numer numerous cases of um, companies that have, uh, that have lev leveraged uh, WebAssembly uh, in their pro product production environments. Uh, for example, uh, if anyone is familiar with Figma, the tool for, for design systems, uh, they actually use WebAssembly uh, to, for, for their um, web application. Uh, the second, point that I would like to raise is that, as we saw from the two lessons that I mentioned, you need to be very caref careful how you plan and design your code, because this can have an impact. And as you saw, if you're, if you're un unsure what are you doing, if you're just passing objects around, uh, you will pay the penalty and uh, um, this, will, um, this will not tur tur turn out well. So you need to take into the consideration what kind of data do you have, what's being transferred between uh, JavaScript or WebAssembly and uh, take that into consideration when building your uh, web applications. And the third point, which it's kind of a double-edged sword, I would say, um, learning Rust. Um, as you saw, I, I did this in, in uh, Rust and I have been learning Rust more or less for one and a half years now, sometimes more, sometimes I haven't done anything in a, in, in a few months. Uh, and Rust is an awesome language. And uh, if you look at some surveys, for example, on st Stack Overflow, you will see that it's the most beloved language at the moment. And there is actually a reason, a reason for this. Um, once, you, once you start working with Rust, you will uh, re realize that. But there is a, also a steep learning curve to Rust um, uh, because I, I know other languages and sometimes when you, when you get in touch with a new language or trying to learn a new language, you can easily, for example, replicate some stuff. So for example, if you know Python, you can replicate some stuff or if you're starting to learn Java or JavaScript or something like that. 
but with, with Rust, I think this replication level was quite, quite low because Rust is, it, 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 it's hard and, um, and it, it really forces you. But I think this is the only language that I have used so far, uh, which forces you to think more about your code and about the design of your application because it's a, a statically compiled language and it's quite fr frustrating a lot of times that your code will not compile and just throw errors. The compiler is very strict, but I think once you compile your code, actually, th these errors that you saw actually are forcing you to restructure your application because when you look at your, at your code and you say, oh, okay, maybe I can restructure this differently or maybe I need, don't need to pass these things around. Um, maybe I could do it differently. And then once you compile, you're guaranteeing that, that, you're, that your core, you have a very, very strong uh, security that your uh, code will, will uh, run properly. And, um, and in general, I would recommend everyone, but just keep in mind that if you want to go the, um, in this direction, you have to invest some time into uh, uh, learning Rust. Go is also um, able to compile to uh, WebAssembly. And of course, if you know C from before, you can also use this to build your WebAssembly modules. So after these uh, 25 minutes, I would say, you are maybe probably wondering like, should I still learn uh, WebAssembly? Well, if you weren't convinced uh, by this, uh, I, I, can, I can again reiterate and say, well, yes, you, you, should, you should learn WebAssembly. I think it's a nice addition to your toolkit and you can use this for some specific problems, um, maybe smaller scale, scale problems, but it, it can still be, be very beneficial for you to, to write better web applications. Um, so one of the reasons why I think you should learn it as well is what also comes um, in the future. So WebAssembly, you have to understand it's, it's very new. I think it started 2015 uh, by Mozilla. Mozilla is the main driver behind this, uh, but now actually Rust has a, um, um, their own foundation and they are building this independently from all other um, major browsers. Uh, and uh, WebAssembly is constantly being um, improved. So one of the things that it's going to land, I think soon is multi-threading. So this actually gives us even more power in our hands. We will be able to use multiple threads to, to run our applications and maybe to do even uh, more serious computations in the browser. Um, interface types, I think this is a very interesting thing um, because it essentially means that um, the example that I showed that WebAssembly only talks in numbers, this is about to change with the interface types. So we won't have this boilerplate code anymore. We, don't, we won't need these uh, intermediate libraries that do the translation from JavaScript objects to, to numbers, for example. Uh, this will be already uh, kind of hard-coded inside of the WebAssembly itself. So you will be just able to pass the, uh, uh, your JavaScript objects um, uh, to your WebAssembly module and this translation will be done um, automatically inside. Um, memory improvements, I talked about um, JavaScript and WebAssembly having two separate memories. This is also going to change in the future. I don't think they will merge these memories, but I think uh, WebAssembly memory will have more responsibilities and it will be easier for these two memories to interact with each other. And one of the things that I think it's going to make WebAssembly, let's say, um, more broadly uh, accepted is uh, portability from other languages. What does that mean? So uh, in the beginning, we only had C and Rust. So these two languages, you can write code in these two languages and you can compile them to, to WebAssembly. As I said, WebAssembly is a binary format. Um, so now you, you can use these three languages to uh, compile to, to WebAssembly, but uh, there are some projects currently are going which will allow other languages to also compile to WebAssembly. So for example, Java. Java is a very popular language. I think a lot of people know it. And I think this kind of um, introduction step to WebAssembly is going to be uh, much, much smaller. The footprint is going to be much smaller because you will be able to write your own language in your own language that you are familiar with and then just compile it to WebAssembly and it will magically uh, run inside your browser. Uh, and with the interface types as well, it will be possible to, for example, write one web, web assembly in Java, another web assembly in, uh, let's say, Rust. And these web assemblies will be able to communicate with each other without any knowledge you know, of, of Java, Rust. Uh, there, there will be a great portability uh, between them. 
And what I think will also happen is that some of the JS frameworks or libraries will move some heavy computations into the WebAssembly. So an example of this can be React. So if you know React and the virtual DOM, how this works, uh, uh, I, I think it's a heavy computation. And to, to determine such things, what, uh, what changes on the page, um, um, it's quite heavy. And I think some of this stuff will be moved into the web assembly. So do the heavy computation there. And then, for example, um, return the result. And soon you can actually already access DOM from web assembly. But I think in the future, this uh, accessibility to DOM will be uh, even um, easier. So I would say um, great times ahead. Uh, if you're still thinking about it, um, don't think twice and maybe start spending some time learning WebAssembly. Um, so that will be all from me. Uh, my name is Nemanja. I work for this company called Tsuke for a few years already. So if somebody is actually looking for a job, I think we are hiring, hiring at the moment. So you can approach me if you are interested. And if you would like to know in more in general about WebAssembly or anything related to web, reach out to me, drop me an email. Um, GitHub, uh, this uh, web application that we saw uh, will, is available on GitHub. I will share the link. And yeah, thank you for listening. Hopefully talk to you guys soon. Well, Any questions? Yeah, I did. I actually, I'm looking for a job and I did apply to your company, I think, but I, don't, I didn't hear back from them. Anyway, that's besides the point. My question for you is like, uh, can I use it to do, uh, you know, Rust to do RESTful APIs and all that? Will that be a performance improvement over WebSockets in JavaScript or how would that pan out? Uh, good question. Uh, so I don't think you can, uh, so the WebAssembly module doesn't have access to all the um, uh, APIs that are provided by the browser. So I, I think the, the for example, HTTP, I don't think it's provided to the WebAssembly module, but if you know about fetch, JavaScript fetch, you can call fetch from WebAssembly and you can you can make your REST call. To be honest, this doesn't, uh, I, I don't think it's a, an improvement uh, because you still, you will still um, make this request, right? Uh, but sometimes you will, you will be able, maybe able to save this, uh, uh, this, um, you don't need to cross the border between the uh, JavaScript and WebAssembly. So it is possible, but I think in the future, it's going to be even more easier to make these uh, web requests and do your processing in the WebAssembly module. Yeah, if you have to go from JavaScript to Rust to JavaScript back, it doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> depends depends on your use case, right? If you, if, you, if you need to use this data afterwards in your JavaScript, for example, to show it on the screen or something like that, then it doesn't make sense to keep it in the WebAssembly. So you can just transfer it, do the computation and return the results, and then just continue process it, processing in, a, in, a, in JavaScript. I would say it really depends on your use case and uh, uh, what kind of problem are you trying to solve? Correct. Yeah, thanks. Um, you said we could can, we could use um, existing C software uh, from the C community or the Rust community and convert into WASM. I'm just um, thinking if you so if we had a C program and we wanted to use it um, in WASM, would we also need the source code to all of the libraries so we can compile it? all at the same time? Uh, no, actually, I can quickly show you that, how that works. Um, so for example, I only, I only have one Rust file here, and this is where all, all my code uh, lies. And here on the top, you see that, for example, I import some libraries. Um, so I don't know, plate two compression. This is a compression library that I used, and it's available uh, in Rust. And uh, Rust has... Uh, something it's called Cargo Tumble. Cargo is a package manager for uh, Rust applications. And the, uh, I mean, uh, we, all familiar, we are all familiar with NPM. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Cargo is the same thing basically. Well, I, I think much better version because it handles dependencies much better. But here you, you just declare your dependencies, right? And for example, you see here, I, I use the CSV uh, library for, for, the, for the processing of my file. And I use this flate to compression library and uh, cargo will, uh, when you, when you compile uh, your, your Rust code, uh, it will pull, pull it down and uh, it, it will, it will compile all the things for you. So uh, you, you don't have to go to the source code or, or do any additional uh, stuff there. Okay. That's great.
Thank you. Well, when you said WASM deals only with numbers, um, I guess you mean it, it deals with bytes. Uh, is it like um, a 64 byte language? Sorry, 64 bit? Oh, good question. I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I can actually show you what kind of a boilerplate code happens, uh, what kind of a boilerplate code is generated by, by the, um, by the Wasm bind gen library. So you can see here, for example, we, 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 we work, they work a lot of with pointers and all this stuff. So they, they put it on the stack. And then here, for example, we take from the memory. So this this code here is automatically uh, generated. I'm not sure. I, I can I can check for you, uh, but but I'm 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 not sure of, of what kind of bytes uh, are we talking about. Okay. But it it saves you a lot of time because you don't have to you know instantiate the memory. And for example, you see here, people who know C malloc it means memory allo allocation allocate. So some of the stuff it's already done for us and but i think in the future this this will also disappear it will be completely uh, hidden from from replication any more questions this doesn't look like C at all. Uh, you said, uh, or oh, if I write in C, it'll compile to Rust or something, or it'll compile to a. No, no. This, this here that you see is a JS file, so this is JavaScript. So it doesn't ah, have okay. to do with C. This is just okay. so this code is loaded by JavaScript, and the the JavaScript is the uh, part which does this translation from a JavaScript object to a number, and then. The number is passed to the WebAssembly module, so this is this is still JavaScript, no no C whatsoever. So is this a library we're looking at now, or, or compiled uh, code? No, this is compiled code. So if you if you if I show you my Rust code, oh, just a second, if I show you my Rust code. Uh, the only thing that you need to do, for example, here I have I have a, a class which is called Sales Record Store. Uh, and I just need to annotate it with this Wasm bind gen. So Wasm bind gen is the library which automatically generates this, this code and it will be handled, handled by me. And then in my JS code, for example, here, you can see that I instantiate, so I call my module, I import it, mm -hmm. and then I instantiate this class and then I can call any, any method on this class basically. So if I go back to the, to the to Rust, you can see here that this is the new. It's, it's actually like a con constructor, and here you can see see my methods. And since the class is annotated with the Wasm bind gen, all this code here will be automatically generated for us. So we don't have to do anything. It does a lot of heavy lifting, and I, I think it's a quite quite a relief uh, for for development. Okay, but, so this sorry, sorry. this this compiled hmm. file. Uh, is then the bridge from JavaScript to Wasm? Or is everything in here, or is it just the just making the bridge? Uh, this is just this is just the bridge. It's just okay. making the bridge. Okay, thank you. But even your uh, Rust code doesn't look like C plus plus, like Impl and all that. This is not C plus plus. Uh, it's not C. No, I, 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 I just mentioned you can do stuff in C, but I don't have oh. any C libraries here. So this. All, all, the whole project is uh, specifically written in Rust. And I would advise to use Rust compared to C because Rust is, uh, first of all, statically typed and uh, does a much better uh, job at memory handling and all these things. Uh, so uh, if you can use, use, use Rust uh, compared to C. So C use case for C is only if you have an existing code in C and then, then you wanna use it in your, your JavaScript application. But if you're writing new code, I would suggest Rust or, or maybe Go as languages. Thanks. And this is actually, you can see one of the pattern that I mentioned without crossing the border too often. You can see when I instantiate my class here, I have a like a private property of sales records. So this is where I store my data. And when I load it, I, I just stored it in this uh, variable. And then actually I have a separate method which I haven't exposed. Well, actually I did, sorry, I'm lying. I did expose it, 
but uh, the, the, this this method doesn't take data; it just takes the item type and then, you know, iterates over that data and does the summarization of, of it. So you can you can keep your stuff in your uh, WebAssembly memory and then do processing on top of it. The three ways you pass the data in your tests: you pass uh, a JSON string, then you tried passing a plain string. And then you pass a binary, just the binary data. Um, and then you say in the future, we might be able to there'll be interface types. We might be able to pass structured data across. Do you think that that seems like the ideal way to me? Because you probably have your data structured in JavaScript already, and you'd like to pass it over structured. Do you think that will be fast or maybe even faster? Because there won't be any parsing after it's been passed. Well, good question. Whatever it will be faster, because you still you still need to convert the objects into numbers somehow, right? Uh, and the thing is, I, I think this translation will still happen, but I think if it's done on the WebAssembly side, it probably it's going to be a way optimized, or maybe they will. Uh, I'm not sure about the implementation of this, but maybe they will add some you know magic code in the in the browser engines, or or in the WebAssembly itself, which will do make this transla uh, translation. Uh, faster. So now mm -hmm. we really need to think about this. And you see here, for example, this is something, it's a, it's a JS value, right? It's not, it's not an, in, in my JavaScript code, this is an array of JS objects, but here it's a JS value. This is just a type which is provided by the uh, web, uh, this Wasm Bindgen library. So it, it's kind of a generic value, let's say, and, and then Wasm Bindgen will know uh, what happens here and it will be in this line here, it will be um, able to turn my objects into um, a vector on an array of 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 of, of my uh, Rust um, kind of a structure here. Okay. Hmm. But if you can, especially with files, as you saw, pass in the the array buffer here uh, when you read the file directly, and it will it will just make your lives e easier and anytime actually when, when you can pass numbers do do that because it's much more uh, performant and actually i forgot to mention that this uh, scales very nice because in the in the first file we had uh, like uh, one uh, 100000 records so uh, if i process a file with million records it it just gets faster so this other file that I just loaded now, it has 1 million records. And you can see, for example, here, it only takes uh, two seconds. And with JavaScript, I, I think it's around nine, 10 seconds uh, to, to make this work. So WebAssembly, it's, it's made for big problems, I would say, but still you can use it for, for smaller optimizations as well. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that um, the only use case for using C is you have some existing code, right? So how about uh, Rust versus Go? Um, do you have any advice on that? Um, good question. I, I haven't used Go. I, I am not familiar with the language it, it itself. Um, Go is also new. I know some people here, I think in Singapore in general, Go, Go I think it's very famous with some startups. So I, I spoke with some people that for example, migrated from Java to Go. And one of the biggest problems that they have, it, they say that the uh, libraries are, uh, uh, there are not uh, a lot of available libraries. So for example, let's say, I don't know, I'm, I'm making up now, but uh, date handling, or for example, the CSV processing or some, some problems that have been already solved in, in these more popular languages are not there in Go. And then you end up, you, you have to write your own stuff. So I think Go is, is still new. Rust has been around for, for some quite quite some time. And I think the benefit of, of Rust compared to Go would be that a lot of C programmers are actually now migrating to Rust. So Rust is not only used, it's actually more used in, for example, embedded software and, and building uh, something closer to the hardware. And uh, um, uh, because of this and because of the big community, I think a lot of libraries from C have been ported over uh, to Rust, so um, I don't know much about about Go, but I would say because of what I what, of these things that I've kind of heard from other people, I think maybe Rust would be more uh, appropriate um, for 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 these libraries. And also, you cannot use all libraries. For, so, for example, WebAssembly cannot access file system yet. 
So if you want to load a file from file system, you, you cannot do this. So the, the entry point needs to be you pass it in the, the numbers or, or or in some kind of other other format, but you cannot read the file directly from the file system. I was going to say in terms of languages, you can also use C sharp because on the .NET world, you also have the opportunity of using WebAssembly with Blazor. Correct, correct. That's also true. Uh, Microsoft has a Blazor framework. Uh, I'm also not familiar, haven't used it, but I know about it. So um, I, I think it's also, as, as I said, I think it's going to be even more broader in the future if, when you start writing Java and then compile it to WebAssembly. So I think then again, you know, it's going to pick up and people that are familiar with their, their uh, comfortable in their, their, their language can use it to immediately compile to WebAssembly. But JavaScript, uh, oh, sorry, Java compiles to, I mean, it needs a Java runtime, JVM, right? Uh, how is that going to, I mean, it's going yeah. to be very heavy. Yeah, good, good one, good one. I, I know there are projects currently that are, that are uh, doing this. So um, may, maybe they will either eliminate this part or, or kind of make the footprint of the JVM smaller. Not, not sure, but there is an ongoing work for this. I think the one with the C sharp, the .NET one, the uh, runtime there is about 617K, just to give a, I know that that world there, that's how large their runtime is. Oh, that's, yeah. And they are using, I think, the co core runtime, the, the, the dot, .NET dot, core. .NET core, yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So as you can see, it, it's still, you know, possible, um, but uh, let's see how it unfolds. So obviously this web uh, module wasm is downloaded uh, you know like if i'm if i if i if i go to browse to a site which actually uses it it'll be downloaded and then used and then discarded correct and it's not discarded it's just as any other file that you sent uh, over the network so if you can see here on the on the left side you have this uh, that uh, wasm file so this is actually the the binary code uh, let's see what happens if i open it like this yeah it's it's not it cannot be loaded normally, but this is the this is the WebAssembly format, and uh, this file you send it to the browser, and if you see it here actually in my web app, and you can check out the code later for more details. But we also need to to load to load this module on the beginning. Uh, so here, this is where the loading of the module happens, and it's a promise, and uh, you need to wait for the promise to to resolve, and then once the module is loaded you're good to go. I mean, it behaves just as uh, any other assets that you would send over from the server. Cool. Okay, more questions. <laughs> Could you also do a progressive web app, the PWA? So you effectively had an install, like an installed app using uh, WebAssembly. Okay, I mean, I'm familiar with uh, progressive web apps, but I don't know about the usage of WebAssembly in these. So for to my understanding, I mean, the progressive web apps introduce the service worker leverage on, on this to make the caching easier and all this stuff, but I'm not sure how how, how it relates to WebAssembly and what would be the, the use case. I'm there. just thinking since it's a, just a, basically it's a manifest and uh, also the worker one, as you said, you in theory could actually build a web application which would be installable, which had a part of it, which is using WebAssembly. Oh, yeah, I mean, yes, I, I, I think I think it's a, it's a two different technologies and two different problems, right? You can, yeah. for example, this app, you can make it a PWA <laughs> and installable. And I don't think it's related to web, WebAssembly in general. Uh, you can or you cannot use the WebAssembly in your web progressive app. I, I, I don't think they are you know, re related or need to work with one another. I think they're completely- No, they're not, they're not related, but you could use them together. That was what I meant. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, there, there are no, I, I think there are no limitations. So the limitations here are only, uh, for example, you cannot use, as, as mentioned, all the APIs provided by the browser, like file system. And uh, a limitation can be, for example, if the library that you want 
is not available in Rust. So for example, one of the things that I know Rust poor is and C is better would be image processing libraries. So if you need like to compress image or do some kind of a image manipulation, I think Rust is uh, limited in that sense. It has some, some things, but C is, is way better uh, in that uh, area. I wonder if you could write a game in C and, you know, <laughs> it's possible theoretically, right? You, know, you, you don't have to wonder that, that these things already exist. So if you go Googling, I think you will find at least uh, a lot of examples on this. So uh, there are literally cases, for example, I know Adobe, um, uh, Adobe, uh, because a lot of their software, I, I don't know if it's Photoshop or, or one of these tools that, that it's used for, you know, graphics and design, uh, a lot of a uh, big portion of it, it's uh, uh, written in C, and they were the one of the first kind of big consumers of WebAssembly. Maybe like two, three years ago, even they worked closely with Google to implement this in the browsers. So they literally took their their C code and just compiled it to WebAssembly, and on top of that, they just built a UI, um, um, a web UI, right in JavaScript and uh, React, I think. And uh, under the hood, they were reusing uh, their existing code. So they, they could already use it out of the box. So video games or anything or any code that you have written already in C, there is a um, great likelihood that you can already compile it to WebAssembly and use it in your web app. Cool. So we can have a web app with no JavaScript at all anymore. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, that's actually kind of um, one of the topics that people are saying, oh, WebAssembly is going to you know, replace JavaScript, but I don't think this is going to happen because I think they solve kind of different problems. Um, there, there are actually some frameworks, React like frameworks, where you can write your HTML and all this stuff inside of, the, inside of Rust, and this will be then generated as a web app. But I, I think, uh, I, I, I'm not sure if this is uh, smart enough. I think what, what JavaScript or web does very good is the separation of concern where you have your HTML and this presentational layer is kind of separated from the, the other things. And I, I think the tools around this are, are far better than, than in Rust. So I, 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 I only see the kind of a future where these two things will cooperate. So you will do the heavy stuff in your web, web assembly and I think most of the stuff will still remain in, in, uh, in JavaScript. Yeah, writing, it'll be interesting writing DOM manipulation in C. <laughs> yeah, let's see. I know C, by the way. I, I live and breathe C and C++. I used to do C, but uh, I think if I was to do something at that level now, I would probably try Rust because I hear <laughs> Rust is the new C. Right. Yep, I, I, I fully recommend Rust. Beautiful language. Um, as I said, it's a bit harder to learn, but there are some good tools and I think their community is, uh, is very good. And uh, for sure, guys, you can, you can use this um, to learn it. I will share the link to the, to the web app. Um, in the chat, so you guys can have a look. I mean, and if you guys have any questions about this, just you know, reach out to me and always willing to discuss. Okay, Nemanja, thanks a lot for your talk and for your for answering all our questions.